Lord, Heavenly Father, we want to just give you praise and glory because you are our Father, because you are our God, and because you are our Lord, and your steadfast faithfulness is forever there and with us. Father, in the name of Jesus, I want to give you thanks in your Psalm 24, where it says, the earth and everything in it is the Lord's. That means, Lord, through everything you can communicate to us when we want you to. You use everything that is in the earth in one form or another to communicate. And Father, we pray now as we look at your word, as we listen to a song, you start speaking to us via your spirit in the name of Jesus. Amen. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. Or another way of looking at that is when the going gets tough, the tough get gone. I believe that the Lord can communicate through all medium. I believe that if the fact he can communicate through his nature, his magnificent radiance, he communicates through worship and song uh, himself. I believe he can communicate to us through the things that may be run that we consider to be worldly and secular. Hence why using that particular song, because if you listen to maybe commercial radio stations in your car a lot during the working week, especially some of those that may have a lot of heart, you might hear that quite often. And maybe God might well remind you this morning of something he's spoken to you this morning as you're listening to that song. It wasn't there just for me to look like a bad dancer. But it's that message, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Or the flip side definitely for me is, when the going gets tough, do the supposed tough suddenly get gone? We're going to look in the letter of James this morning. And you'll dive, excellent. It's going to be chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. Letter of James is probably maybe a letter that once you've read it the once, you might tend to want to avoid it slightly. Um, I heard last night from somebody that actually it's one of their favourite letters. I am praying for them. Um, But it is a good and wonderful letter. But it does appear to be one of the letters that seems to say that actually uh, salvation only comes through how we work, how our grace is given to us by God, by deeds. That's not what it says, but that's how some people take it because there is a misunderstanding of what is being said there. And also it may not be one of your most favorite letters because it can make uncomfortable, especially if you talk a lot. Because it does say that your tongue is like the small rudder of a very large ship. It seems to steer your course for you, whether you say good things or bad things. And personally, my favorite uh, personal verse in there, James 3.1. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers or sisters, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly really warms the cockles of my heart that I'm going to be judged, and as myself and Pastor David, and others who teach, we are judged more strictly. Doesn't that make you happy? I need caffeine after that. Right. But it's an early letter, probably written, we think, around AD 49, AD 50, when, um, and we'll come to it in a moment, but when the, just after a great outbreak of persecution, as revealed in Acts 8, came upon the church, and the church sort of scattered, and we'll come to that in a minute. But it's written by James, who was one of the leaders of the Jerusalem church, but more importantly, I think, for this particular moment this morning, was also the brother of Jesus, quite literally the brother of Jesus, the half-brother of Jesus. So in verse 1, he states, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. I just said to you, this is James, 
the brother of Jesus. And here he states that he is a servant of God. That's fine. But make this statement and of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the brother whom he grew up with. A brother who he may have played with. A brother who he would have ate with as a child. Might have had play fights with. Yes, Jesus was a boy. He was normal. Didn't say it was violent. But might have had a good old, good old tussle for a giggle with his brother. Might have had slight debates with. Might have vied for mum and dad's attention with. Laughed with, slept with, cried, lived. Knew everything about this brother that he grew up with. And he states this. This brother of mine is the long-awaited anointed one, the long-awaited Messiah. This is my Lord. Just see if you can get your head around that for a minute. I'd like you maybe to imagine if you've got a sibling or you have a close family member, just, just imagine for a minute thinking of them as the Lord. Just for a second. Could you imagine that? Maybe a cousin or whatever, and you suddenly realize they are the awaited anointed one, the Messiah. You might think they're a bit mad. We have a glimpse in Matthew 12, 46, that Jesus' family weren't quite 100% sure that Jesus might need it to be pulled to one side and had a quick word with about some of his teachings. But this is James saying, this Jesus, this brother whom I've grown up with, is actually Lord. I have a brother. That would be interesting. I just, you know, I sat there for myself just for a moment and just thought, what would it be if I thought, if it turned out he was the Lord? So if there's anybody who's got a right to be complacent in their relationship with Jesus, I think it would be James. If anybody thought that they're going to be all right with the Lord at the point of death, it could be James. He's my brother, isn't it? He's my bro. He's my flesh and blood. I'll get to the pearly gates. He's going to say, yo, brave, high five, come on in. Do you remember when we were 12? Do you remember when we were... Do you remember when you stayed at the temple? Whoa, with mum and dad fuming when they went to go and get you. Could you imagine that? Yeah, let's have a laugh and giggle. So if anybody could be complacent, you could say it could be James. He could chill a little bit, be a bit relaxed about it. Hey, it's my brother. I grew up with him. It's not a problem. I know I'll be fine. It's not what, it's who you know. And I'm in. Same genetics. It's okay. So when this half-brother of Jesus writes this letter, talking primarily, partially about Christian maturity and how a Christian should be and what should be going on in the face of persecution or in the face of trouble... And it might make us feel a bit uncomfortable. But this is the brother of Jesus who could be a little bit more relaxed maybe. And he's not. I think we should take note of what he has to say a lot more firmly in my opinion. So he's written it to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. As I said, the Jewish Christians, uh, are great. Uh, this is where Stephen had just been stoned in Acts at the end of Acts 7. And Acts 8, a great persecution broke out upon the church and the church had to scatter to the nations. So he's trying to write to encourage them. Now, I'm giving you his background because I think I might be carrying on with the letter of James after my, in September after my annual leave. I just thought I'd note that, by the way. This is my last Sunday with you until September. That was mixed. 
I'm not quite sure if Joy was down about the fact that I'd be spending more time at home or what at that point, but anyway. But I'm hoping that we're going to carry on, that, that uh, we might carry on with this letter in September. So, scattered to the 12 tribes. So, verses 2 to 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, by the way. I'm not going to keep saying that. This is meant to be to both. Whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. I love this phrase, whenever you face trials, it's not if you might, may be possible, it's you will. So when you face these trials, or adversities would be another good phrase to use. You will face many kinds. The word for many kinds is not well rendered here in the English. The Greek really means many colored all different shapes and sizes, many different forms, and at different times. These trials, these adversities will come at you in different ways. They never look the same. That's what it's trying to get at. We don't quite render it, say, many kinds. It doesn't quite give the full flavor of what's trying to be said there. And they can come at you not just one at a time. I had a friend, I remember a friend once, who normally took trials and adversity in his stride if they came one at a time. I was always amazed when things would go wrong and something quite big would come at him, would seem to take it very, very lightly and very much in his stride and would rely very much on the Lord, no problem. But there was a particular moment in his life when three Differing kinds of adversity came at him all at once, all within the same week. His mood had seriously changed. And then when I asked him and challenged him about that, he actually said, I'm okay when it's one at a time. I get a bit antsy when it's two at a time. But when it's three, I'm more like a panicked duck. And that's what he turned into. You know, normally ducks look calm on the surface and their legs are flapping underneath, yeah, like crazy. Well, that was the whole of him. His feathers were rustled, the whole lot. He went into a complete sort of meltdown when trials came thrice all at once at him. I always wondered what it would be like after four or five. What would I be like after one or two or three or four or five? Trials come in many different shapes and forms, do they not? Our adversities come to us in very, very different shapes and forms. And just, just sometimes when you're in the midst of a trial and there seems to be light at the end of the tunnel, another one comes and bites you right in the backside. Yes? I wish to convey how it feels. I'm sure I'm not talking to anybody who's not been through some sort of adversity. But it comes, and man, does it sink its teeth in. And you're going, where did you come from? Why are you here? I was just got rid of that lot. It was just starting to look okay. And it just, oh man, and it goes for the flesh. And it goes for the bit that really hurts. Adversities and trials do that. And James says, consider this pure joy. <laughs> James? But why does James say that? If James says it, we've got to take note. There's a reason. We don't poo poo it. We don't go, yeah, you're having a laugh, aren't you? You've got to say, well, okay, there's a reason why I've got to consider it pure joy. He says in verse 3, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must, must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete. Not lacking anything. Who wants to lack nothing? Okay, there's a chunk of you that I don't care. 
Who wants to lack nothing? We're not talking financial here. We're just talking a maturity, a spiritual maturity that means you lack nothing. According to James, perseverance has got to do its work first. What's perseverance? Well, it could be the ability to endure patiently. Perseverance has this habit of treating, teaching you to endure patiently. Maybe enduring a difficult person that you have to work alongside with, be it in your work or voluntary capacity. The ability to endure patiently big family problems, maybe serious illnesses. It's apparently what perseverance does. Perseverance also teaches you to become an obedient disciple. It helps you be obedient to God. Because if you've gone through things with God, you learn he's a faithful God. So sometimes when he says, wait, you learn obedience and waiting. When he tells you to go, you go. But for me, more importantly, I think for this morning, perseverance teaches you steadfast faithfulness in God, not to become a part-time Christian. When adversity comes, you learn through perseverance to hold on to the Lord no matter what and continue to work and be for him even when you're in the midst of serious difficulties. And we'll unpack that a little bit more later. Perseverance is something that our society does not teach very well. Oh, it teaches that you should go to work popping pills inside your throat to keep going when you're ill, which I wouldn't consider to be perseverance. Because sometimes if your body's saying you're sick, sick, you listen to your body. And I need to learn that lesson myself. <clears throat> but our society teaches now, if you can't win at games, don't worry, there's no such things as losers anymore. So don't keep the training going. It's only for the elite few who are up in Glasgow at the moment. Tom in the diving got a gold in Edinburgh. If you don't like someone in your job, ah, go quick, go find another one. Don't try and work it through. If you're struggling in relational conflicts with friends, ah, don't worry, don't bother trying to work it out. Just dump them, go and find new ones. You laugh, but this is what our society teaches us. Struggling in church, not finding maybe the worship or the teaching time currently to your liking. Need I say it? Change the PA man. <laughs> Don't even go there, Barry. I've got a microphone. I'm not saying that's anyone here, but actually we can see that in church. In other in church, do happen. There is this sense of, ah, that doesn't suit me. I'm not worried about what God is saying, whether I should stay or not. That doesn't suit me. It's not suiting my mood right now. I'm going to go somewhere else. It's going to fill my needs. And that's what our society teaches us, and that's how it infiltrates the, infiltrates the way we are at church. Perseverance is seen as a bad thing because it is a result of suffering. Which is true. It is through suffering you learn perseverance. But unfortunately, in our society, suffering is something apparently to be avoided at all costs. You shouldn't suffer, so avoid it. Well, we live in a broken world. We're going to suffer. If you spend half your life trying to avoid suffering, you're not going to have much of a life because that's all you're looking for is avoidance. And that's not what God calls us to do. And I'm going to say this. This is the biblical concept of trials and testing. Stulak, one of the people I was reading, said, the biblical concept of a testing, as James uses it here, 
is one that does reveal the genuineness of a person's faith. But, James says, the test is also designed to develop something that is not yet present in full measure in the person. Our society says avoid suffering. Our God says, actually, no, suffering does something. It brings out something in you that is new. It grows something in you that is new. We are to see suffering as different. Now, I want to use this phrase. I mentioned earlier on in this week that I was talking on this, and it made very clear to me, please do not tell me you're going to tell us that we laugh our way through trials and adversities. That is not what I'm saying. You do not laugh your way through them. But there is a way of looking at trials and adversities that says, there is something new that God is doing here. In me, through me. Something new is going to grow in me. A trial can be seen as a positive element when you look back afterwards and go, wow, something new has grown in me. It's been a new spiritual growth in me. There's been a new sense of perseverance. I can handle situations better because I've learned about our faithful God. And I'm sure I am talking to plenty of people who have done that and are going through trials today. And maybe for you, this is God saying, persevere. I always like something new growing in me. I don't like gardening, so, um, so I rather the growth happened in me rather than in the soil. It's Joy's job. But when she plants in, well, she loves gardening. When she plants and we can, she gets a real enjoyment of seeing, excuse me, love, I know I wasn't going to use it, but anyway, she sees a real joy in seeing the plant grow and flourish and the flower, yeah? But she spends her time keeping it, well fed, well watered, sometimes dealing with rogue foxes or whatever else who might want to cause trouble and, and rogue creatures and cats might squash it or lay on it. But you see eventually that beautiful thing grow and you can look and enjoy it. Partly for me, trials and adversities like that sometimes. That actually it's not until you see the result afterwards you say the toil and the trouble was well worth the new growth that has happened within me. I've become more mature. I'm starting to lack less. So how does this happen? Well, verses 5 to 8 says this. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt. Because he who doubts is like the wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not think they will receive anything from the Lord. They are a double-minded person, un unstable in all they do. Excuse me. When adversity comes along and bites you there, sometimes what's your first reaction? Help! Panic. Run around like a headless chicken, not sure what to do. Meltdown mode. Do everything. Go and ask everybody else under the sun, what do I do? What do I do? Go and seek all human help that you can possibly do. You run round, not sure. James says, actually, ask God for wisdom. And God will give it generously and liberally. He'll just give it. You ask for wisdom, he'll just give it. If you ask for wisdom in your trial and your adversity, he will give it. Because he's a generous God. He'll just go, yes, you want wisdom? Oh, fantastic. Want wisdom? Great. Yeah, here's wisdom for you over there. God just gives it because you ask. Problem is, some of us read James 
when it says about without finding fault. We misread that. We think it means that I've got to be without fault before God will give it to me. I've heard it plenty of times. Oh, I've got to be perfect before God will give me wisdom. Now, my grammar's not the best in the world. And that's how I used to read that. But that's not what it's saying. If you can look at the English translations we got now, if you would just read it, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously, and it will be given to him. The without finding fault is actually that God will give it to you, and he won't tell you any of your faults that he sees in you. He'll just give it to you. Because you recognize your spiritual poverty. You recognize the fact that the reason you're asking God for wisdom is that you cannot sort this out for yourself. So you're actually saying, Lord, I don't know what to do here. God says, fantastic, you're in the right place. His wisdom. You don't need to be perfect to get it. He gives it to you without pointing out any faults in you. Have you got me? You with me so far? So if you're going through a trial right now, if you're going through adversity and you feel you can't ask God for wisdom because you are not sure that he's going to give it to you because you think you're at fault, and you might well be, but he's still going to give you the wisdom. Because he'll point, you know, eventually he'll say, when you look back, you realize you made a mistake, but it's okay, I'm going to give you wisdom now to work through it. But there is a caveat. And this is it. That when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. You must believe that you are going to receive this wisdom. Excuse me a moment. If you couldn't tell, I just blew my nose. Right. You must believe it and not doubt. Now, this is not name it and claim it theology. Let's make this very clear now, shall we? There is this thing that we name something and we claim it and, and, and it's going to happen anyway because I've said it's going to happen. Lord, you're going to fill my bank balance with £2,000 this month. It's not that. And because I believe it's going to happen, it will happen. No, it's not that. It's not that I want £2,000. It was just the first figure that sprung to mind. Timmy might be thinking that about the building works here, but that's not what I'm thinking. I know it's more than 2,000, Uncle Timmy. I'm aware of that, and I'm sure you'll come to us later. But I am talking about here, it's about being double-minded. The point here is actually it's not doubting God. It's not doubting God's faithfulness. But it's also about the double-minded person. The double-minded person who is someone who doesn't actually know which camp they are in at this time. What James is saying here is you've either got to be fully for the Lord... Or not. You're fully for the Lord, or you've still got one foot in the world. And you're not quite sure which camp you want to be in. That's a double-minded. Tossed about by the waves. Tossed about by the teaching of today. Like I said earlier on, our world does not teach us perseverance. So it's very easy for us Christians sometimes to think, yeah, I can't be bothered. It's not going to happen. I'll just give up. It's about a consistency of walking with God in adversity and not thinking, do you know, I'm just going to back down. I'm just going to sort of quit and go to one side. I don't think the Lord is that faithful. Saying, you've got to believe and not doubt. Don't be double-minded. Don't put your trust in anything else other than God through your trials. When the going gets tough... Does the God tough in you come out or does you go and get gone? Don't be double-minded. Believe in God. Receive his wisdom. Don't be tossed around by the teaching of today. That is what he's saying. Be consistent. 
just because it's another trial, another adversity, why is the same faithful God going to be any less faithful then or now than he was then? How's that going to happen? Don't be double-minded. Believe, receive. As I said, I come back to this phrase again. I am not talking about laughing your way through trials, but it is a conscious mental belief to believe that God is faithful and he will give you what you need to see you through this adversity. The double-minded person is unstable in all they do because it depends upon where they feel at that time and at that moment where their loyalty will lie and what they will do. James said that person shouldn't expect to get wisdom from God because they're just blowing around in the wind a lot. And he uses this in verses 9 to 11. The brother in humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position. But the one who is rich should take pride in his low position because he will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. It blossoms, falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich man will fade away even while he goes about his business. It's almost for me here a case of Jesus saying to them, do you trust in God or do you trust in your wealth? James initially is talking to the brother Christian in humble circumstances. Maybe here the view was that the Christians were looking to the non-Christian rich people and thinking, well, they seem to have it all. They've got their money. They've got no problems. If I had money, I'd be all right. Because they've been scattered, they clearly had to leave and maybe left a lot of their possessions or some wealth behind and they were living in poverty in other areas. And maybe they were looking at the non-Christians and thinking, the rich ones, and thinking, oh, I want to be like them. James is saying, no, take pride in your humble position because actually your status in God is vastly higher than any money or security. He's not here talking to non He's not talking to Christian rich people. When he talks about, but the one who is rich, never once is he referring to rich Christians. He's talking just to the rich people in the area. Don't be double-minded. Trust in God. Don't trust in financial security. Verse 12. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test... He will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Verse 12 is really a summary of the previous verses. The trials you are going through now will grow in you that which you previously never had. Perseverance. And persevere because God has given you the crown of life. Persevere in your trials because there is a crown of life waiting for you and you've already got it now. may not feel like it, but you have. There is this strange belief sometimes that being a Christian means that life should be easy. It's a Western concept that, as I said to you earlier on, all suffering should be avoided like the plague. And therefore then, life should be easy, but it's not in the Bible. And adversities and trials come, as I said, in different forms and shapes. But I want us to be very cautious about something because sometimes we blow things out of proportion. Or the world blows what they see as trials and adversities out of proportion. 
Who watches the DIY programs? Come on, just admit it, come on. Goodness me. Now, some of those programs are really amazing. They go along and help people whose houses are in a state of disrepair or, or whatever else. And, and the reason they're like that is either great tragedies hit the family at some point, maybe a death in the family, serious illnesses, loss of jobs into the point where due to illness and there's no way they can regain it. And so they put the house back to a proper living standard where well, they go beyond that. They design it into this beautiful show house. I've always wanted to go back a year later and see what they look like afterwards. Anyway. And they genuinely are helping very needy people. But I remember watching one program, and I can't remember if it was one of these DIY programs, but it was to do with some reporting that was going on. And um, they come across this couple who had two children. Both parents had jobs. And they were just talking about their life and, and, and how, not the parents weren't, but the way the reporter was doing it was with an incredibly simpering voice of, Yes, you have a job each. Yes, your husband has to go to work seven o'clock in the morning and may not return until seven o'clock at night, Monday to Friday. Oh, of course, and both children are at school and, and the struggle of rushing them to school and then you have to go to get to your work and then if one of them's ill, you have to leave your work and arrange to leave and go and collect them and take them home. Do you get the point? And it was all this, and I went, it's normal life! <laughs> I literally screamed it at the TV. I was, I, I was like, what? Sorry? And I think there was something along the lines of, oh yes, and you've got to do your DIY work on the Saturday, because you only got two days to spend with your children. I'm like, hello? I bet there's, I know tons of people would love to have that time with their children, but they have to work two or three jobs to make just ends meet. And what I'm trying to get up, please let's not mix up trials and adversities with what is just normal life. There is this strange belief that we are not meant to be working this hard. I think there's some strange belief for some of us that we may be, when we die, we're going to be sitting on clouds playing harps. In the Old Testament, we were meant to work the ground. We were meant to manage our Lord's creation for him. That does mean work. The problem was the fall of Adam and Eve meant we had to toil. There is a big difference. But we were designed to be active. It's a song I love, and I have no idea where it comes from. I've heard it since I was a kid, and I love it. I'm not going to sing it, but I'm going to quote the lyrics. I'm busy doing nothing, singing the whole day through, trying to find lots of things not to do. I wish to be unhappy, but I do not have the time. And he goes on something like that. Uh, I don't have any time. I'd like to be unhappy, but I do not have the time. I'm busy doing nothing. Isn't it such a crime? And it goes on like that. But basically, the whole song, I've just gone out of my head. I don't, I don't normally recite it at home all the time. Well, sing it badly to joy at home all the time. But there is this strange belief that we're not meant to do anything. This is normal life. Please, let's not take trials and adversities that is normal life as such and blow it up out of all proportion. Because that's what our world does. We as Christians are not meant to do that. We're meant to get a godly perspective on things. Now, I am not saying that we suffer in silence. If you're going through troubles at work, everybody goes through troubles at work. But you are not meant to suffer in silence. You are meant to give it to prayer. But don't make it bigger than it really needs to be. Do you see what I mean? And everybody's adversity and trial is dependent upon their previous experience. If you've sailed through life with hardly any real problems... You're going to come across something, it might really hit you, but somebody else who spent their whole life going through difficulties of illness and, and trouble and whatever else, they'll look at that and go, what? That's nothing. But the person who has been through the bigger difficulties needs to work alongside the other one and say, it's okay. I'll walk with you. I've, I know where you've been. I've been with you. You know, that's the patient endurance. That's perseverance developed. I can help my brother or sister along that line. But let's not blow some things out of trouble that is actually normal life experience. 
The crown of life is for now, but it's not the key to easy life. So James is saying, really, the true question is, is Christ worth following if your spouse has an affair and leaves you? Is Christ worth following if you lose your job? If you lose money? If you lose a loved one? If you lose your health? Is Christ worth following? The answer is... Yes. Oh, good, that's all right then. We're safe. point is that God has promised something to those who love him, the crown of life when you go through adversity. But he has promised that something new will grow in you when you're going through it. You are to consider it pure joy. And then we've got to make this point, verses 13 to... Yeah, we'll go to the end of 18. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives, full birth, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. God does not send us evil to tempt us. So no one should say, ah, oh, God is tempting me. God has put this trial in front of me. God allows trials to happen. He allows adversity to happen. You look in the book of Job, he didn't send what we now consider to be loose Satan to go and attack Job, he actually said, well, if you're going to go and do it, do it, but you can't do this, 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 and this. He actually limited what Satan can do. But he didn't send him. So God does not send us trials. He does not send us evil. But he does use it to teach us perseverance. Do you understand the difference? We live in a broken world. So God allows things to happen, but actually it's for our ultimate good. So something new will grow in us. So if you think that you're in the middle of a trial and God has sent this to you, he has not. So then what James then is then continuing to say here, actually, for God cannot be tempted by evil, none does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when, by their own evil desire, they are dragged away and enticed. What James is getting at is that when we are going through trials, we are tempted to respond by doing something wrong in response to the trial. If you're suddenly going through adversity, you might want to go and retaliate against the person who's causing you the adversity, which is the wrong thing to do, maybe. But also sometimes we like to do what I call the escapism act. I'm going through problems, I'm going through adversity, I want to momentarily forget that I'm going through that at the moment, so I want to go and do something that's going to help me forget briefly. And it could well be a weakness that's already in your life, that you've decided, you know something, I've got a good excuse here to go off and do it. I'm only human. What James is saying, actually, it's here. It's actually when you go and do that, you're enticed by your own evil desire. 
you want to go and do it really deep down underneath. So you're using your trial as an excuse to go and do it. It could be you want to go and get drunk. You want to have unmarried sex. You might want to look at pornography. You want to go and gossip. You might want to go and hurt somebody else just to make them feel bad. Just because it will make you feel better. And we all justify this. Note the we. We all can justify by saying, but I'm going through this. You don't know what I'm going through. I had a moment of weakness. And what James is saying, yeah, but these are actually your own evil desires anyway. Ones that you've never actually dealt with. You haven't worked through. And sometimes these adversities come out to bring that to the surface so it can be dealt with as well. But you shouldn't use it because once you do that, once you give birth to it, it will lead to death. Don't use it as an excuse. You must persevere in your trial with God. Do not be double-minded. Sit with God. God in this trial. Doesn't make easy reading, does it? I read this this week and I thought, goodness me, this is not going to be a fun one. But as I said, if the brother of Jesus says, this is how we're meant to be, this is, produces maturity, then I think we should take note. Also, there is another element in this I hadn't noticed before, but it was in the commentaries that sometimes when we're going through adversity and we've blown it slightly out of proportion, we might stop serving God. We retreat. We sort of curl up and sit in a corner. Now, there are times our adversities, our trials, our illnesses or family bereavement or whatever, and that is the right thing to do at a time is to retract from doing serving in the church or serving God at the moment to go and be healed and to go and recover. Sometimes that is correct. There's nothing wrong with doing that as long as you do it with conversations with fellow Christians or leaders of the church. I'm not talking about anybody here. It's just something I read. But there are sometimes that people just do it and just, just disappear without saying anything. And you see that as a good excuse because of the adversity they're going through. But it's okay for me just to call up and forget working for the Lord. Part of this here, James is saying, actually, that's really your desire at the end of the day. You just don't really want to do anything. So you're going to curl up and you're going to use it as a good excuse to disappear. There's another thing here about this very quickly. If you think God sends you trouble and he is Lord, the mental state is then not to challenge it. If, God is, if you're going through an injustice in your workplace and you have some strange belief that God has sent you this injustice to teach you a lesson, you're not going to challenge that injustice, are you? Because it's God that sent it, yeah? Do you understand the... But God doesn't send us things. God expects us to challenge injustice. He says it in Micah. He expects us to challenge injustice. So if you think God's ever sent you injustice or trouble in that form, he has not. You are meant to challenge it. Why bother asking God for wisdom in what to do if he's saying, well, I've sent it to you. Don't do anything. Do you get the point? God doesn't send us these problems. We're meant to recognize that. He actually wants us to work through it with him in wisdom and bring things, something out. To conclude... If you're going through an adversity now, do you consider it pure joy? There's lots of shifting in seats. You could be bored. That's fine. I understand that. This may have been a trial for you this morning for the last 50 minutes. You never know. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> Thank you, Pastor David. I must admit, none of you have got up and gone yet, so you're doing well. Chris, stay. There are two responses to trials. You can respond out of your evil desire, making the trial an occasion of temptation leading to sin. You can make any trial or adversity a good excuse to go and do what you want to do. Or you can respond out of faith with joy that you are truly blessed. This response makes the trial an opportunity for testing instead of temptation. And this testing develops perseverance that causes the Christian to become more like Jesus, mature and complete. When the going gets tough, the tough can get going. Or the tough can get up and gone. I don't know what trials you're going through. Well, clearly no, some of you. But others could be going things I don't know about. You're meant to consider it pure joy because ask God liberally for wisdom. Who will give it to you? And look at it as an opportunity for you to grow in your faith, not as an opportunity for you to go and do what you want to do. We are called as Christians to persevere is to walk through these trials with our Lord. To actually mentally say, yes, Lord, you are faithful. And I'm not standing here as one one and saying, oh, it's all rosy and sun sunshine. This is so easy to do. It is a conscious effort that we have to make every day with our Lord to persevere. To go through it with him at all times. And this will bring about a maturity in each and every one of us as individuals, but also a maturity in us as God's household. Do you get the point? So I don't know what you're going through, but James is saying, persevere. Not on your own, but in the strength of the Lord. Let us pray. Give you a few moments just to talk to God. Lord, if we were honest, we would want to scream when we're in adversity and trials of many different kinds. Get me out of here. But Lord, also, when we recognize and read your word and realize, and actually it's through this, that you will birth something new in us. A greater capacity to deal with adversity. A greater capacity to understand and know deep in us your faithfulness. Father, I pray for each and every one of us who are going through trials and adversities at this time that you will help us to consider it pure joy. To look at the situation through your eyes, to look at this as an opportunity for us to grow. To say we are truly blessed because our Lord is gonna grow something new in us today. In the name of Jesus, amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.